Today, there are two million descendants of French Canadian immigrants living in New England. These are our stories. Welcome to the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. Venez tous jeunes filles et garçons, je vais vous raconter l'histoire de notre immigration ici au USA, de grands aventuriers de pays étrangers. So before we get going with this week's episode, I kind of just wanted to put out kind of a message heads up when we start. So because this recording that you are about to hear for this episode is actually the longest Mike and I have ever gone between the time we actually record an interview and the time we actually publish the interview. It's been a number of months. And we were talking mainly about an event that happened in December 2023. So just to give you a heads up, we were talking about President Macron's visit to New Orleans, and we talked about it with Joseph Dunn. Now, I still think it's a super, super awesome episode, actually. We listened to it uh, just recently. For a couple of reasons. First, I think it's important that we still talk about that visit because there's a lot of impact, potential impact, from prolonged potential impact from his visit. It's obviously a huge story when the president of France visits New Orleans. But on top of that, there was just a ton of discussion with Joseph Dunn on a whole bunch of other things kind of tangentially related to President Macron's trip to New Orleans. And those of you who have listened to Joseph Dunn on this podcast before, you know that I am a huge, huge fan of his. And it's funny, like every time I have a conversation with Joseph, I leave that conversation honestly just fired up, like challenging myself to what can I do? What more should I do? Um, what kind of communication should I have with others to make sure I loop other people in? Like, it's just a motivational, like it's just a motivating guy. You can't, at least I can, have a conversation with him without really being excited and motivated and just drawn to continue the work that we all dedicate ourselves to. So for those reasons, I thought it was really, really important. And a big reason for the delay was that we recorded this before Mike and I decided that we were actually going to go to our current system of seasons. So this was recorded back before we knew we were going to have seasons. And so now that Obviously, we have a season schedule in place. It's been a long time. So anyway, this is a long way of kind of a disclaimer almost of just being like, so just explain it to everybody that this topic is something that we recorded a long time ago. I think it's still super, super interesting and absolutely relevant. Enjoy the conversation with the great Joseph Dunn. This is the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. I am Jesse Martineau. Now, an event that happened a number of months ago now that we have not had the chance to speak about on the podcast is that the president of France, Emmanuel Macron, and his wife, and his wife Brigitte, visited New Orleans. Now, this is obviously a huge, huge deal. It was the first visit by a president of France in nearly 50 years to New Orleans. So this is clearly a topic that needed to be discussed on the podcast. And to discuss this truly historic event, we are incredibly fortunate to be joined by a Chevalier de l'Ordre National du Mérite of the Republic of France, Joseph Dunn. He is the former executive director of the Council for the Development of French in Louisiana. He has held positions at the Louisiana Office of Tourism, the Louisiana Travel Promotion Association, the Louisiana Office of Cultural Development, the Office of the Lieutenant Governor, and the Consulate General of France in New Orleans. He currently oversees communications, public relations, and marketing at Laura. Louisiana's Creole Heritage Site. And this is not the first time we've had Joseph on the podcast, and a couple of things have happened since we've last had Joseph on the show. The Joseph, he was inducted into the Order de Francophone d'Amérique by Quebec's Ministry of the French Language. This was last year, and Joseph is now King Joseph Dunn. Two topics I will absolutely have to talk about on the show. I, there's actually a website to prove that he is King Joseph Dunn that we will obviously link in the notes. He's a great friend of the podcast. Joseph, welcome back to the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. Oh, my goodness, Jesse. Thanks so much for having me back. That's that's fun. Uh, yeah, a lot of stuff has, has happened since, since we saw each other uh, in person in New York in May last year at the OIF offices at the UN for the launch of the of the book uh, French All Around Us, which has now been translated into French as well, which just came out. 
Uh, so thanks a lot to our friends at Calic, uh, Fabrice Dumont, and uh, Kathy Stein Smith for putting that together, and all of our other friends who collaborated on on that project. So, so lots of stuff has been going on. <laughs> this is very cool. What is the Ordre de Francophone d'Amérique? The Ordre de Francophone d'Amérique is an annual recognition of people in North America who are concerned with the French language, who work on French language topics and things like that. So there's a whole nomination process. I was very lucky, lucky to be nominated by um, uh, the Council for Development of French in Louisiana for that. Um, and they choose a, a number of people who are in Canada, so there are lots of different Canadians working in Quebec and outside of Quebec on the French language. There's always someone from the Americas, which can be someone from the States or the Caribbean or South America. And there's always someone from the exterior of North America. So that's someone who is not in North America, obviously, or, or in, sure. in the Americas. Um, and this past year, it was a... Um, researcher from Italy who studies specifically Quebec, uh, the, the Quebec French language, Quebec culture, and who teaches that at her university. So uh, it's a pretty uh, a pretty diverse group of people that, that comes together around that. And uh, it was an, an amazing, amazing experience to have that recognition and to be in, in Quebec City for that ceremony with my wife uh, back in November. That is so, yeah, because I was just looking at like the list of some of those who have won it in the past. And like you're saying, there's like one person from the great anywhere else, from the greater North America area that is in Canada that wins this thing every year. So that is absolutely incredible to be on that list. That is so very cool. Where was the event? Uh, the event was in Quebec City and the uh, actual ceremony was in yeah. the Palais Montcalm, which is right oh, there. You know, cool. it's like right there yeah. at, the, at the Porte Saint-Jean. Uh, where in front of it every year when it's cold, they turn it into an ice skating rink, a public ice skating rink. Uh, but it was it was a really incredible event. Okay. So, and I also mentioned you are now King Joseph Dunn at this webpage that says so. So can you please tell us about, was it the, the crew? Can I spell it crew? The crew de Jean d'Arc and how you went about becoming a monarch. And like, how did this happen? I should probably explain a little bit about Mardi Gras first because oh, of course. the sure. whole carnival season in New Orleans. So everybody's familiar with the images that you see on television of Mardi Gras and it's all that crazy stuff happening in the French quarter. But um, generally speaking, Mardi Gras is a very, very family centered event. And not only do you have uh, the crazy stuff going on in the, in the old city center, uh, what is now called the French quarter, which in French we call the Vieux Carré, but also things happening in other parts of the city. So, um, carnival season is an old Catholic church season, and it kicks off, obviously, with the Epiphany on January 6th. January 6th happens to be the birthday of St. Joan of Arc, who in French is Jeanne d'Arc. And uh, about 10, 15 years ago, uh, one of my friends began a very small walking procession to celebrate Joan of Arc's birthday and Joan of Arc as the patron saint of the city of New Orleans, uh, because we have oh. a replica statue of Joan of Arc. It, it looks just like the one that's in Paris. And Joan of Arc liberated the city of Orléans in France on May 8th in uh, way, way back there. 14, whatever it was, because I can never remember that date. <laughs> um, but anyway, so New Orleans is also a sister city with the city of Orléans in France. So old oh. Orléans, New Orléans. And uh, every year uh, the parade has grown and it is the first walking parade of the Mardi Gras season. So this is not what you see on television. This is not a parade where you have big floats with people throwing things. This is a sure. walking procession. It gotcha. goes through the old city center and it's basically a tableau it is a tableau vivant of the life of joan of arc and it's in many ways based upon the tableau vivant of the life of joan of arc that they do in orleans in france and they're doing that parade in orleans in france for more than 500 years it's an incredible wow. incredible spectacle to see and so uh there is a young uh, woman uh, usually a high school or who is chosen to be joan of arc there's a whole Concours. So there's uh, basically a competition where sure. uh, this young woman has to submit a 
um, a proposal to be chosen. She has to go through a series of interviews. She has to be able to speak uh, French uh, at a passable conversational level. So she gets to be Joan of Arc and she rides on a horse through the French Quarter. And then That's there amazing. is the queen, who is Queen Yolande, who was uh, Queen of Navarre during this time period. And then there is a King Charles VII, who was the Dauphin during the time that Joan of Arc was leading her crusade. And so I was chosen to be the king of France and got to ride, got to dress up and with a crown <laughs> and with with a cape. And I had was uh, in a pedicab. If everybody knows what a pedicab is, it's sort of like a rickshaw, but it's uh, like you have a seat and you have a person on a bicycle that's attached to the front of it. And but they had that decorated like a royal litter or a carriage because they had a paper mache <laughs> horse head on the front of the. That's awesome. On the front of the, the the handlebars of the bicycle, and it was absolutely incredible. It it was just an incredible experience. Are there pictures? Please tell me there are pictures of this. Oh, event. there are pictures everywhere. I mean, I put a lot. <laughs> I, I put a lot on my social media. So if you want to go oh, grab some, yeah, you're we're certainly have to welcome do that. to do that. Um, but yeah. the it's called the Crew de Jeanne d'Arc, uh, and they do all kinds of incredible things during the year. There's a salon in September usually that is more sort of like an academic thing where they talk about the life of Joan of Arc so they bring oh, wow. speakers in who are specialists in Joan of Arc and the time period and all that so yeah there's a lot of stuff that goes uh, goes along with it so it's not just that one time thing it's you're you're the king throughout the year and uh, for the king it is usually a guy who is either a French national who lives in New Orleans and who's very involved in French language stuff or French language cultural stuff in the city, or it can be a Louisiana person like me, because I'm not a French national, uh, who works sort of doing the same kinds of kinds of initiatives and things. So that's kind of how I got chosen. That's awesome. That's very, very fun. It was so, it was probably one of the coolest things I've ever done. I need to hook up with this group. I find, again, parenthetically here, Mike, I find the whole Joan of Arc story beyond fascinating. Like everything about her history is absolutely wild. Like how that entire, how her story even happened to begin with is nutty. If you read, I've read some of the transcripts of, of that trial. It's, it's completely crazy. So now it's super interesting. It definitely is. It definitely, definitely is. And if you ever get a chance to go to France, to go to Orléans for their big thing, because we only yeah. do, our parade is just on January 6th. So we, our parade opens the carnival season. So we are the very, very first parade of the entire carnival season because you have different parades and then everything sort of crescendos with, with the weekend before Mardi Gras Day. And Mardi sure. Gras Day is always on a Tuesday, Mardi Gras, Fat Tuesday, and it moves based upon the calendar for Easter, right? Because it's because Mardi Gras happens and then you're in the Catholic season of Lent and then right. 40 days later you have uh, you have Easter. So Mardi Gras moves mm -hmm. based upon the calendar. And nobody can see me like rocking back and forth <laughs> here and doing all the yes. doing all the, the hand it, motions it, that it talking with my it hands. It, yes. it shifts based upon the, the calendar and based upon when, when Easter is. No, that's cool. Yeah, no, I haven't been uh, to Orléans. I've been to Rouen. Okay. They have that really nice, like, kind of monument. It's a pretty powerful monument for, you know, where she was burned right in well, the downtown area. You know, as I was saying, in France, it's a, it's a, I think it's a two or almost three week event that moves because in France, the Joan is chosen and she chooses her pages. And there's a whole committee of people that, and and she basically retraces the entire pathway of Joan leading up to the liberation of Orléans on May. Oh 8. wow! So coming all from the east. Exactly. Oh wow! So she goes to all of the what are called the villes joanniques. So the villes joanniques are all of the cities in France that are associated with Joan of Arc, and. That's awesome. And, you know, she has to take uh, horse riding lessons because all this stuff is done on horseback. And I'm friends with the young woman who was the Joan in 2015 in France. And she said the armor is extremely heavy. And a lot of the stuff that they wear is actually authentically reproduced. It's not yeah. just 
costume stuff. It's ex- it's what Joan would have worn, the capes that the people who represent the royalty are real ermine and wow. their their collection pieces, their their museum pieces. That's fascinating. It is. It really, really is. And so another quick little anecdote about that. There's a whole association in France of the women over the years who have portrayed Joan. And oh. the woman is still alive who p- was portraying Joan on May 8th in 1945 as the parade oh, wow. was happening. As the parade was happening, the church bells started tolling because the American troops had come in during the war to liberate Orléans on the same day that's so crazy that joan liberated orleans some however many 500 yeah, years sure. earlier wow and that's an incredible story to hear because uh interestingly enough we're twinned with orleans in new orleans but sure. their first real international twinning with a with a, a city in the united states is with wichita and kansas here's why because it was the american troops from wichita who liberated orleans in 1945 gotcha Wow, that's wild. That's a cool story. I mean, there's all this really, really yeah, cool Yeah, I need to look into this. Yeah, I need to look into Especially, I mean, you talk about all the costumes. Considering how much of what her eventual trouble was was because she was wearing men's clothes. So to know how important that clothing was to her story. I mean, that's so fascinating that they take the time to make, uh, authentically reproduce everything. That's very, very neat. It definitely is. Okay, cool. So, Emmanuel Macron visiting... New Orleans. Now, this was in December, so mm-hmm. it's been a little bit now. It's been a couple before, months. Yeah, so before we get going into like, the event itself, how did this happen? How did this come about to begin, at, to begin with? Well, we have an incredibly active consul general in New Orleans because we have a French consulate general in New Orleans. And uh, obviously, it was all over the media that Macron was coming to D.C. for the bilateral visit with the United States the official visit to uh, to the White House and to speak uh, in all the places that he did. And in the diplomatic channels, obviously, everybody knew that because sure. you have 10 French consulates general across the United States, and they were informed of this through the diplomatic channels and knew that he was coming to the States. And it was uh, it everything just sort of coalesced for uh, our consul general here, uh, Madame Nathalie Beras, to reach out to the French ambassador who just retired, um, Philippe Etienne, and really work this angle of getting him to come to Louisiana. So there's a lots of things happening behind the scenes at the level of the French consulate general, uh, has a whole team working on it. They brought people in from Houston to help with it because obviously to plan such a huge thing, because the president wasn't traveling alone. He had his wife with him and he had a delegation of around 80 people so he had a whole team of journalists traveling with him. He had some wow. of his legislators traveling with him, other supporters. He had a whole group of people. There were some institutional uh, people. There were some cultural people. So it was a giant delegation. So you can imagine sure. that planning that and planning the movement and then on the ground also planning uh, how to move them and also sure. who they were going to be meeting with and all of that took an entire team of people. So not only is the consulate working on it, our uh, director of our Alliance Française, who's Émilie Georget, was working on it as well. And then they brought in a couple of other people to help as well. I got looped into it really close to the end of the planning process uh, because they were trying to break some of these, some of the de- delegation into different smaller groups to do things. And so I ended up with a group of the legislators escorting them through some of our museums in the city on a walking tour through the city. And then from there, we went to the big final speech that the president did at the New Orleans Museum of Art. Now, and this because this sounds incredible. How long did you have from the day you found, or the group have, maybe not yourself, but from the day they found out he's definitely coming to the date they had to pull this off? Because this is a lot of stuff to be done, having to do. My guess would be in a relatively short amount of time. Well, there was a lot of it. Uh, I think they started working on it perhaps a month out. But Still a lot then, for a month. But yeah. then there's a lot of back and forth that goes through because not only, and I, I don't, having, having worked at the French consulate and having worked sure. on other visits that weren't of that level of importance, I can tell you that there are lots of layers that things have to go through before they're approved. So you you submit, you, you come up with an idea 
on the ground. Then you submit that to the embassy. The embassy submits that to the president's cabinet, and it all has to trickle back down. So it's constantly back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Then when you're actually executing on the ground, things are changing constantly. So it's uh, one of those situations where you can plan for everything, but it's going to skew. And that uh, was you know, obviously what happened with some of the, some of the visit, which was an incredible, incredible success. No, that's, that's really cool. So I guess big picture then now we get this all set up. What, what was, what did he do? What was his schedule? Like what is him and Madame Macron, how they spend their like 12 hours in New Orleans? Correct. So they, they arrived at the airport. There was a motorcade that brought them from the airport to the uh, French quarter so that's about a 15-minute car ride. Okay. He was greeted at the airport by the governor of the state, by the mayor of New Orleans. And then when he arrived in the French Quarter, there were other people there waiting to greet him when he pulled in. I was with a whole other group of people inside the Cabildo. So if anybody sure. has an image of that iconic image of New Orleans where you have the big white cathedral in the middle... So yep. if you can imagine that you're looking at that, and that building is flanked on either side by two buildings as well. So if you're looking straight on at the cathedral, on the left side is what is called the Cabilda. So that's the old uh, Spanish administrative building that dates from 1795. And that's where the uh, transfer of Louisiana uh, from France to the United States was signed on this side of the Atlantic. So it's an incredible historic building. It's part of the state museum system. And there's a great area in the uh, upper floor where you have uh, windows and you can look out over Jackson Square and you look out over the street. So we were all gathered in there to await the arrival of Madame Macron because they were being split up. He was going to go one way, she was going to go the other. And uh, they pull up. Obviously, they've got the motorcade, they've got the security. He gets out of the car, and I don't think that he was expecting that there would be that many people there. There, it, oh really? It looked, it it was looked like it was packed. It looked like it looked kind of like Mardi Gras. Uh, That's awesome. You know, people were there waiting to see him, and of course, his security people were freaking out because he's immediately <laughs> going out into the crowd to shake hands and say hello to people and all of that. And uh, so they finally got him, I think, corralled to a certain extent, and he went down to the historic New Orleans collection for some meetings there with the governor. We talk about climate issues and uh, other things like that. And then eventually Madame Macron came into the Cabildo uh, where there was a reception for her, where we got to speak with her a little bit about different issues and things like that. And then I peeled off to go accompany the legislators for their little walk around and their museum visit. So, so you, you were in attendance at the, I saw it described as a luncheon cocktail at the Cabildo. Exactly. I was at the attendance in that with Madame Macron. Yes. Nice. And so what I've never uh, attended a, a luncheon cocktail with a first lady of a country. What is a luncheon cocktail with Madame Macron look like? Imagine a reception room, a, a banquet hall, for, perhaps with a buffet set up of uh, buffet. Uh, food that nice. you can so that you can sort of walk around and everybody can pick up what they want to eat. There are cocktails being served. There are high boy tables around so that everybody can yep. stand and eat and circulate around in the room, uh, which is a museum space. Recall yeah. that this is a museum space. And uh, she um, was with her translator, was not everybody in the in the place spoke French, and uh, moving from group to group, chatting with them about different subjects. That's awesome. Now, did you get to talk to her? I did uh, briefly. Uh, we spoke a little bit about uh, obviously the French language in Louisiana, French language sure. education, and uh, tourism in Louisiana. Because uh, uh, the the reason obviously that he he came to Louisiana is because we're a former French colony. Right. We're very well known uh, in the in the larger French speaking world as a place where we're focused on French language education development of the French language, uh, maintenance of the French language. And Louisiana is the only state in the United States through the Council for the Development of French in Louisiana and our state government, because Codefil is a state agency. A lot of people think of it as an organization, but it's actually a state agency. Uh, we have these bilateral accords, direct bilateral accords with French That's that awesome. allow us to recruit teachers to come and teach in our immersion schools and also uh, provide for other kinds of uh, partnerships in culture, uh, 
uh, in media, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we have that bilateral uh, sure. accord there. I mean, the fact also that we're we're you know a former French colony, people still speak French and Creole here. And uh, the oldest consulate general in the United States is in New Orleans. It dates from 1824. So uh, that French presence, even after we were sold to the United States by Napoleon in 1803, has 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 uh, remained as sure. um, as an institutional legacy. That's so yeah. Because I guess one of the per it just reminded me one of the perks of being from especially Manchester, New Hampshire, but New Hampshire in general, is we used to have the, the first in the nation primary all the time. So, you know, the presidential candidates would come around and you get a chance to meet a bunch of them. And one of the first things would be like, oh, that's great. You talked with Obama. What did you guys talk about? And it's just such a question that I guess if we haven't done that, like been in that situation, obviously it makes sense. It's a, <laughs> it seems like a normal question. Like, yeah, you got to talk to the pres uh, the Senator Obama. What what exactly do you guys chat about when you meet Senator Obama? So that is cool that you got to talk to her though. And you also have to wonder though, what, because they do these things all the time. What do they right. actually retain from these conversations? Right. Do, do <laughs> they, are, are, are they impactful and uh, do they actually make a difference because, you know, they are talking to lots of people. I mean, I think sure. they do to a certain extent because, you know, not only do you have the person, him or her or their self, you also have the people who are around them who are taking notes so that they can then follow up because, you know, obviously they're not going to remember everybody they meet and everything that they talk about. Right. Yeah, no, that it is. Yeah, that's a great point. It's true. Um, but anyhow, so she, you got a chance to talk to her at the Cabildo, and you mentioned uh, the President Macron had a it was it was a signing that dealt with climate change. What what was this event about? I've not actually seen the document, but because Louisiana is a coastal state, and because climate change is obviously affecting us visibly here, uh, like you can almost watch it. You, you can almost watch sea level rise happen here. It's it's that apparent and that visible. Uh, yeah. We lose the estimations are that we lose the equivalent of a football field of uh, of land to coastal erosion every ninety minutes or so, and <sighs> it's incredible to look at uh, aerial maps of the coastal region from say seventy five years ago and then lay them over with today, and lots of things that were land where oh, there were cow yeah. there were literal cow pastures like seventy five sure. years ago is now water. Uh, so it is an issue that we are very aware of, and uh, you know, France being one of the leaders of the the, the COP twenty and, and all of that is obviously interested in it as well. So uh, I've not seen the document of what the agreement looks like, but I do know that there was some kind of a cooperative agreement that was signed for uh, France and Louisiana to look at these issues together. Gotcha, and this was at, and this was at the historic New Orleans collection. Is at that... the historic New Orleans collection, correct? It and where, is. Where is this? What is this? It's in the. It's in. It's on Royal Street in the uh, Vieux Carré in the in the French Quarter. Uh, it's just a couple of blocks actually from the Cabildo where I was, and it is a private foundation that was set up. Oof, I forget back in the early seventies maybe, but it's a great museum space and repository for archives about the history of the city and the history of Louisiana. So they do lots of incredible programming there as well that has to do with with history and culture and uh, things like that. Awesome. All right. Very cool. And then I guess, was it after this that he made his way to the New Orleans Museum of Art? So, yes. Yeah. Okay. And what, and what went down there? What went down there? So the New Orleans Museum of Art is a an incredible historic space and so you've got a main entrance hall area kind of with a marble staircase that leads up to the upper gallery so they do a lot of events there because you can fit a lot of people into into that space so they had a stage that set up in the middle and uh, uh, the president was obviously not immediately out he came out uh, a little bit later so you had zachary richard who sang uh, a solo at the top, uh, a cappella at the top of the stairs, the oldest known recorded or written song 
in Louisiana, which dates from 1714 in uh, Natchitoches. The song is called uh, Un Nakitosh. And uh, Nakitoche was the first French fort that was established in the uh, Louisiana colony. So it dates from sure. 1714. It's older than New Orleans. And it's up uh, in the middle of what is now the state of Louisiana. Oh, wow. So he sang that song. Uh, the president came out and he began his speech. Uh, you had probably 150, 250 people who were in, uh, in, in attendance. And he did his speech in French. I, I have been sort of underlining and, and reminding people that the fact that Macron did his speech in French in Louisiana was a rather incredible statement because it underlined and highlighted the fact that he was in a French-speaking space within the United States. So he didn't do a speech in French in D.C. Yeah. I don't think he did one in, I don't know, that he did he go to New York this time? I'm not even sure. I don't remember what his yeah. itinerary was outside of Louisiana. But that he did his speech in French in Louisiana was a pretty incredible statement. Sure. Uh, because uh, awesome. I only saw a few people in the audience who had earphones on for simultaneous translation. Most people did not. Uh, and a lot of the people in the in the room obviously are people that that I know and work with and all that. But there were a few faces in in the crowd that I didn't I didn't really recognize, uh, which was also interesting to see. It was a diverse group of people. There were Native Americans there. There were Afro descended people there. There were quote unquote white people there. Uh, it was a diverse group of people, and uh, his his speech was. Uh, very eloquent. He's an, he's a really, really charismatic and good speaker. Uh, I was a little bit surprised when I saw him at how how not tall he is. Because <laughs> <laughs> sure. when you see him on television, you sort of yeah. have the idea that he's this like six foot yeah. tall dude, and he's he's really not. He's he's a smaller guy, um, very petite, very French, <laughs> but with a natural charisma when he speaks that just immediately draws you into to what he's saying and you really have the idea or the impression that he's speaking almost directly to you even though he's awesome. addressing a a large crowd uh, and so he talked a, a lot about uh, these different initiatives that the french government has put in place to help with the defense and the development of the french language in the united states and he spoke for quite a bit from what i see he spoke for 20 minutes he spoke yeah. for 20 minutes that's pretty good that's a and in the in the in the midst of it, with yeah. all of the energy that was in the room, obviously you can imagine that you're only grasping snippets of what he's saying because it's just such an incredible moment. And you're looking guess, at yeah. the reaction of everybody and people are taking pictures and you just wanna sort of soak it all in that sure. the the content of the of the speech didn't immediately sink in. So sure. I went back uh, this morning and, and rewatched it to take some notes to talk a little bit more in depth about what was said, just apart from the, the grande ligne or the, the, the headlines of, of some of the, the sound bites of, of what he said. Yeah. So what, what did he talk about then? Well, he said a few things that were really poignant. He opened his speech with saying that he had this sentiment d'être à la maison. He felt like he was at home and that there That's was awesome. une familière étrangeté, a strange familiarness, uh, which is what I feel when That's I so go cool. to France or when I go to Quebec or into other other French speaking places because you 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 see and you feel these things that are very very familiar but they're not quite the same. Um, so That's that so was cool. really cool to hear him say that. Uh, but to come to these initiatives that he was talking about was kind of funny because uh, he joked a couple of times about these French initiatives emanating from the French government being labeled 
in English. So uh, the sure. French duo language fund. So the French duo <laughs> language fund, which was yeah. launched in New York in 2017. <laughs> um, and he also mentioned that uh, they were able to raise $1.5 million in philanthropic investments. Uh, and that now through this French dual language fund that is worked out of the, I think, the FACE Foundation at the French Embassy in, in New York, they have 35,000 students in That's 29 amazing. states that are benefiting from these programs. And you know, the idea of, of making French more accessible, because we have this idea in the United States of French being this very elite, very inaccessible language. But you know, yeah, and I know, you know, up there in, in, in New England, I know down here in Louisiana that French was a working class people language. It wasn't sure. the language of the elite necessarily. And nope. so how to bridge that gap to talk about, you know, this This is not just a language of people who were going to be able to go shop in the Place Vendôme or who are drinking champagne and eating caviar. It's also a language of, of normal, everyday people living and working and socializing and living again in in this language um and he is really interested in he said in the speech of, of undoing this idea of the elitism of the french language that is so cool yeah it was it really really was because i mean that's something that we that we battle here now right um in, in louisiana because you've got people who think oh it's just a language for people who are really intellectual who are really educated but that's not really been the case french here yeah. was the, the the language french and creole both were, were the language of of common everyday people so in fact i i know i'm guessing maybe down there too but up here for sure um speaking french got you targeted in the opposite way if you spoke French, you were considered somebody who was not intelligent, not educated. Somebody who was probably poor, just worked at a mill, didn't have anything going for them. So the people tried to hide it for that reason. Yeah. Same thing. Exact same thing down here. Uh, I know a number of, of people who are just a generation older than I am. So in yeah. their in their 70s and their, their early 80s who tell me they would not speak French in public. At the moment they left the, the intimacy of the household – and the protection of the of the household, there is no way that they would be heard speaking French outside the house, in the streets, or just generally like that. So, yeah. um, you know, we 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 have some some work to do. I think up there where you are, and down here where I am, on on unhiding French. Um, yeah. And you know, actually, um, Scott Tilton from the New Foundation has said mm -hmm. that quite often. He's like, you know, French exists all around us, but it's hidden uh, because we sort of default to English because that's the dominant language. And we take for granted that people don't speak French instead of doing the opposite thing and assuming that they do. Uh, so, yeah, there, there's a, a, a lot of similarities in the what yeah. what goes on up there and what goes on down here and it's that wanting to hide unfortunately that led to a lot of that generation not teaching their kids even exactly. if both of them spoke fluent french they made sure the kids did not exactly exactly so during the course of the president's speech he also announced this new initiative called wait for it french for all french for all and yeah. he's got quite a number of yeah, it's good, right? Yes. Yeah. He's got quite a number of uh, of uh, philanthropists and companies and other groups that are going to help with this. That uh, includes some of some some brand names, some some uh, French brand names that people know about, because there are a lot of immigrant children in the united states a lot of them from the caribbean and from west africa who speak french sure you know we've seen that with that great uh, film le carrefour uh, that's in lewiston auburn and how the influx of these french-speaking africans has helped revitalize french in lewiston auburn and, and in other places so how to keep those children of immigrants engaged with French as a heritage language 
And also this idea that it's a language of opportunity. It's a language for cultural opportunities, for economic opportunities, for young people from throughout the Francophone world who either came here or who are already here in the United States. And he announced that there in the university sector are going to be some scholarships, some uh, funding put available for uh, marginalized students. So in the, in the French higher education program, so a hundred of them so that they can do uh, internships and training in France. And with this also comes a policy and some help to train teachers of French, which is called, wait for it, New Pathways to Teaching French. <laughs> So new Very pathways creative. to teaching French <laughs> to help encourage a new generation of teachers of French. So there will be 200 scholarships that are that will be made available uh, for people to be teaching assistants in France, probably through the That's TAPIF awesome. program. Uh, the TAPIF program is through the French embassy that allows um, young people who have their uh, their bachelor's degree to go and teach English in France, but at the same time, they're also living within um, villages and towns and cities in, in France. So they're they're absorbed, they're absorbing, they're gotcha. immersed in, in French language and French culture while they're there. He announced, well, the president, when he was here, yeah. announced the Sommet de la Francophonie, which is the biannual gathering of all the French speaking heads of states and all that people. It's actually going to take place in France in 2024. But there were a couple of things that come back to this idea of, of local language that y'all deal with up there, that we deal with down here. And I'm going to read it in French, and then I will sure. translate it into English. He said, and I quote, « L'histoire du français est une bataille permanente entre patois, des langues vernaculaires, et une langue académique. Cette mm. bataille n'a jamais été réglée. So the history of, of the French language is a permanent battle between different patois, vernacular languages, and an academic language. And this battle has never been won. But he also said, il faut continuer d'inventer des mots dans notre langue. We must continue to invent words in our language. Sure. And he followed that up by talking about Specific, no, he didn't say specific Louisiana words, but saying, you know, how the language is developed in Louisiana, how the language is developed in Africa, and how France does not own the French language, how we all own it, and we all participate it, and we all participate in it. And I think that was, from my perspective, very telling to have that kind of, that kind of perspective. Sure. From the president of France, recognizing that not everybody is going to speak like somebody who came out of the finest schools in Paris, that we all have our own ways of speaking French, and that all of these ways of speaking French are equally valid. And I, over the course of my life, have become much less prescriptivist about these kinds of questions and much more descriptivist about these kinds of questions. And, you know, talking about the fact that your French in Maine, your French in New Hampshire, your French in Louisiana, your French in Missouri are equally yeah. as valid as languages as the French that is spoken in the finest schools in Paris. Which is very awesome to hear from the president of France. Because, as you said, that's a battle that's been going on, continues to go on. And you would think that there would probably be plenty of people in some of those university institutions in France who would not necessarily share that same type of sentiment. So I think that was very, very cool. Now our fathers look at us and sigh with despair To think that everything they love we simply do not share But the spirit never dies, our culture will survive Each of us must choose how much to keep alive Each of us must choose how much to keep alive
Special thanks to Josie Vashon for providing the music. You can find more about her at josievashon.com. This podcast was produced and edited by Mike Campbell. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at fclpodcast at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at FCL Podcast for more information about the topics discussed. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to this episode.